Have you heard of check kiting? Check kiting is a type of fraud that involves moving about theoretical funds using two separate bank checking accounts. A check is written to the criminal from one bank is first deposited, and more importantly credited, to an account at a second separate bank. Because that second bank now shows a positive balance, the criminal can withdraw enough money to deposit back into the first bank before the check bounce is due to a lack of funds. This form of check kiting may seem to be too complicated for such a small payoff, but moving these funds back and forth between accounts can buy the criminal enterprise enough time to generate real significant money that will likely cover any other outstanding checks. Some people have been known to use this method, called circular check kiting, when several checks on an overdrawn account may come due before a paycheck or other regular funds can be deposited. The circular check kiting scheme depends on the bank's delay between receipt of deposits and checks and their eventual processing, also known as float time. You'll also find that some people who may be a bit short on funds could resort to writing a bad check in anticipation of a deposit during the float time. While this in itself is an illegal act, the chances of getting caught by the bank or prosecuted by a retailer are pretty slim. A professional check kiter, also referred to as a paper hanger, is more motivated by personal gain than economic survival, in most cases. A professional check kiter will continue to slush funds between accounts until he or she is caught by the law or a bank catches on to the scam. There is another form of check kiting which involves the unwitting participation of a third party. A paper hanging customer may make a very small purchase and pay for it by check. Because grocery stores often allow customers to overwrite a check for additional cash, the check may be written for the maximum amount allowed. Funds from a second account may be sloshed over to cover the amount of the check, but the cash remains in the custody of the dishonest customer. The illegal practice of check kiting may have met its match in modern technology, however. Most banks now use an electronic receipt system, which instantly records and in many cases processes cash transactions. Some credit unions and rural banks may still use older methods however. Technology has definitely reduced if not eliminated what we call flow time between banks and other financial institutions. It is now much more difficult to withdraw funds from one bank and deposit them in another before the two banks can compare transaction records. Without significant flow time, check kiting schemes have become too risky for many professional paper hangers and con artists. Did you know, the specific laws regarding the issuance of a bad check vary from state to state New York has strict policies in place with respect to bounced checks. According to most bankers, the definition of a bounced check is one that cannot be processed because the person issuing the check has insufficient funds in his or her account to cover the amount. In such an instance, the balance check will be returned to the writer, who can face fines and possibly jail time depending on the circumstances. When a check bounce is due to a calculation error on the part of the writer, or a slow direct deposit cycle that left his or her bank account below, it is considered an accidental situation. If this happens in the state of New York, the writer of the check is charged with a civil crime and is responsible for reimbursing the payee the full amount of the check, plus a fine of two times the amount of the check up to $750. These monies must be paid within 30 days after the writer receives notification that the check has bounced. According to the Debt Collection Steps website, if a bad check is written intentionally to defraud the recipient, the issuer is subject to criminal prosecution and arrest and can be sentenced to up to three months in jail in New York. In lieu of jail time, the writer can be expected to pay a fine of up to $500, or up to double the amount of the draws gained from the commission of the offense, according to the National Check Fraud Center. Intention to defraud is not always easy to prove, but most courts of law consider it suspicious if the writer does not pay fines within 30 days of receiving written notice that the check was not honored. All banks charge a certain bounce check fee to their customers. According to the website credit.com, the average fee charged by the issuing bank is nearly $40.
Some banks in New York State require a credit report as part of the review before allowing an individual to open up an account at their establishment. Repeatedly bouncing checks will undoubtedly damage credit reputation. When most people apply for a bank account, the majority of banks use an agency called Chicks Systems to see whether a person has mishandled any accounts in the past. A negative report can affect whether your application for a new account is therefore accepted. The review process is similar to what happens when someone applies for a credit card or installment loan. A card issuer generally goes through at least one major credit reporting bureau to look up your credit. This helps it determine if you're a risky customer for a new credit card. When you apply for a bank account, the bank reviews Chicks Systems to find any negative banking history you might have. Chicks Systems is a national consumer reporting agency that keeps track of people who have mishandled a savings or checking account by having a check bounce or failing to pay a fee, for example. Credit unions, check cashing outlets as well as banks share information about these individuals and whether the bank closed their accounts. In return, the agency collects these consumer histories and creates risk scores for banks to use as they consider potential customers. Approximately 80% of banks and credit unions use Chick Systems reports to help them decide to approve or deny bank account applicants, according to an organization known as Credit Builders Alliance, a non-profit group that helps low-income consumers build strong credit. The entity known as Chick Systems provides the following information to lenders about potential clients. Risk scores, Chick Systems consumer scores are similar to FICO credit scores and range from 100 through 899. As you would expect, the higher score, the better. An individual can request their personal score from the agency through various methods noted online. Reports, the reports show items such as unpaid fees primarily from overdrafts, checks bounced at retail establishments and any suspected fraud. Reports also list credit inquiries, check orders and consumer-initiated credit freezes. If a person has been a victim of identity theft, they have the right to place a freeze on their Chick Systems consumer report. This means no new financial account can be approved unless duly authorized. Consumers can get a free copy of their report once a year by visiting the official Chick Systems website. But don't be surprised if you don't have one, it's actually a good thing. Unlike credit reports, these focus mostly on negative account history. Here's a review of the top 10 issues affecting real estate professionals. Most every real estate transaction you can be involved with presents the potential for a legal pitfall. There are many buyers and sellers in the world that wouldn't think a thing about suing their real estate professional if they felt they were unjustly treated. The modern media doesn't help our case either by putting the idea into everyone's heads. There's Court TV, Judge Judy, People's Court, Judge Mathis, dozens of commercials offering legal services and free consultations so you can learn your rights, etc, etc. Lawsuits are based on both common and statutory laws, and for a variety of reasons, including misrepresentation or non-disclosure of property conditions, breach of fiduciary duty which falls under our laws of agency, and unlawful discrimination covering numerous fair housing issues, and there are many more. When you combine an increasing litigious society with a strong housing market because of unprecedented long-term low interest rates, you could say it's the perfect storm for more lawsuits. Yet, despite the growing number of suits, licensees are found not liable in almost three quarters of the cases, according to reports from the National Association of Realtors. The best way to avoid the multitude of legal pitfalls is for the real estate professional to become familiar with the various claims. Let's look at some of them now. 1. Misrepresentation is by far the lawsuit that brokers face most often. Over the last decade and more, over 50% of the lawsuits brought against real estate practitioners insured under the National Association of Realtors endorsed errors and admissions program were for misrepresentation. Just over 10% were for the close cousin of misrepresentation, the failure to properly disclose. 
we define misrepresentation as the misstating of some material feature of the property. Failure to disclose is just flat out not clearly revealing some important features of the property. Most commonly misrepresented are the foundation and structural features 20% of lawsuits. Other misrepresentations involve property boundaries, the roof, and pest infestation and termite related problems. Commonly omitted disclosures include easements, remodeling and general renovations that were done without a building permit and title issues and related problems. Misrepresentations are broken down into three basic categories, innocent misrepresentations, clear negligence, and the worst of all, clear fraudulent misrepresentations. In New York, negligent misrepresentations are also known as puffing because they're done without the intent to defraud. These include failure to disclose significant property flaws out of ignorance. Fraudulent misrepresentation is purposefully hiding a property flaw or feature in order to facilitate the transaction or sale. If a licensee receives property information from any third party source, he or she should be sure to attribute the information to that particular source, stating, for example, according to the seller, the garage roof is five years old. Be sure to further document in all file notes anything extra that could prove useful later if legal actions unfortunately occur. To be sued for misrepresentation, the misstatement has to involve a material fact and not just your personal opinion. Material facts are those that a reasonable purchaser would reasonably rely upon when making the decision to purchase. Many courts have concluded that a person may rely on statements that the seller declares to you, unless you have reason to doubt what that seller is saying, we say the test of reasonableness. In many states, including New York, we must disclose any adverse property conditions we're aware of regardless of our position in the transaction. Other states go a step further and require that a licensee not only disclose what they know but require that the agent or broker conduct a reasonable visual inspection of the property, then disclose what that inspection reveals. The more experienced you are as an agent, or depending upon your background, the courts have shown to hold these individuals at a higher level or threshold based on years of experience compared to a newbie licensee. To limit misrepresentation liability we encourage that licensees encourage the use of home inspectors, share the applicable property condition disclosure rules that apply. In New York for example, real estate licensees cannot assist the property seller with completing their forms. Be sure to also document seller's sources of information as well as to encourage them to utilize the assistance of other professionals, such as professional home inspectors and knowledgeable attorneys when appropriate. Agents should never make broad and founded statements that essentially could be construed as predictions like the soil here is perfect for all kinds of farming or if you make such and such a modification your home will be worth thousands of dollars more. Stick to the facts and what is known now and always use appropriate qualifiers to limit your liability. Be sure to also share the information with the broker who sponsors you as they are also responsible for your actions in most cases. Number 2. Agency problems as well as breach of fiduciary responsibilities. We typically call this law of agency. These lawsuits most frequently arise when a problem with a transaction causes one of the parties to seek legal advice and the attorney asks, well, which agent was representing you just over 10% of these cases affect licensees? Many of the suits involve claims of undisclosed dual agency. The National Association of Realtors Code of Ethics mandates agency disclosure, and most states including New York has very specific rules which govern the method as well as the timing accordingly. In New York the phrase, at the first substantive moment, is most often referenced as to when the agency disclosure form must be completed. Unless in writing is specifically exempt under the law. We keep our courses current with any Department of State changes so when you take your course for continuing education you will have current information presented to you. Always be sure to use the latest agency disclosure form as presented by your state and or association of realtors.
they must generally be used with buyers, sellers, tenants and landlords. New York actually has several forms for buyers, sellers and tenants landlords. Spend time reviewing exemptions to the law and timing of events so you stay in compliance appropriately. Document that you disclosed as well as forms may disappear. In New York, we have a refusal to sign the agency disclosure form form. This is used when you meet with an individual that has no interest in signing anything at all without regard to whether it binds them or not. We know that in most states including New York, a buyer or tenant as well as a seller or landlord is not committed to having to work with you just because the form was completed. The form just states that you as a licensee appropriately disclosed your agency relationship timely in accordance with the law. Next we look at fair housing related items. These violations account for less than 2% of litigation involving real estate licensees, but they can be very costly in terms of the subsequent judgments. This area of concerns can further be complicated since state and local laws can add protected classes such as LGBTQ issues, gay, gender neutral, transgender, lesbian, as well as issues related to source of income for qualifying to federal fair housing laws and their applicable rights. If sellers don't want to sell to someone of a certain ethnic background or race, licensees should distance themselves from people like that. You simply cannot afford to take on people who want to do business that way. States and housing agencies are a popular source to test whether licensees are following federal, state and local fair housing laws. Many courts nationwide have held that testing real estate agents and brokers with fake buyers or sellers is lawful. Lawsuits can also be brought against multiple listing services because members have included remarks online that violated federal fair housing laws including statements like perfect size for empty nesters, a perfect example of violating familial status and close to XYZ synagogue, a perfect example of religious status violations. Publishing such information online carries the same legal liability as publishing it in a print periodical. To limit your fair housing liability, attend education regularly. In New York, real estate licensees complete a minimum of three hours every two years as part of the license renewal requirement. Be sure to document how you treat everyone so that everyone is sure to get equal treatment. Technology makes it much easier than it used to be. Encourage your office manager to discuss fair housing and current laws, especially the real specific town fair housing and the discrimination laws that may not be as well known at weekly office meetings so new and part-time agents are kept in a loop. Antitrust laws are another point of contention. These are intended to prevent unreasonable restraints of trade. Examples of antitrust violations that impact you are price fixing and group boycotts. Competing brokers should never engage in discussions of their commission rates or the amount of compensation they offer cooperating brokers. Licensees must be careful to avoid conduct that could lead to allegations that you agreed not to do business with a certain competitor or genre of competitors such as flat fee brokers, etc. To limit antitrust liability, adopt an office-wide policy that addresses such issues as discussing commission rates with potential sellers, and education of all sales associates with respect to antitrust compliance policy. Avoid pre-printing commission rates on standard form contracts or in advertising. False or misleading advertising is another popular way agents and brokers get themselves into trouble. These types of lawsuits can also address affinity programs, for sale sign bans, and internet advertising, always a touchy and fluid topic. Advertising must always comply with state license law and related regulations. To limit advertising liability agents must ensure that all real estate advertising is truthful and not misleading in any way. Focusing on the property attributes is key to avoid discrimination claims. Another issue the real estate profession runs into problems with is independent contractor status disagreements and state labor law violations. Over 90% of the real estate industry employs licensees in the status of independent contractor. 
There are federal and state laws that must be followed as there is workmen's compensation, unemployment as well as social security, state and federal tax consequences. Mistakes whether intentional or not affect both broker and the agent being supervised. The best way to limit your liability in terms of independent contractor or employee issues is to educate yourself about your state law requirements regarding independent contractor status, use written agreements between you and your sales associates, and create an employee handbook if you're a managing broker owner. In addition, be sure to document that your associates have reviewed and read your manual policy and procedures manual. It's not just something corporate America should be worrying about. It affects everyone today. Environmental issues are another point of contention in the world of real estate. Agents and brokers run across properties affected by lead-based paint, asbestos, and groundwater contamination to name a few. Wait until I tell you about a detailed report from the Department of Housing and Urban Development on the nationwide research completed regarding lead-based paint levels found in residential housing units. In this research, the target population was all permanently occupied, non-institutional housing units in the United States in which children may live. Thus, vacant housing and seasonal housing, such as vacation homes, were ineligible for the survey, as well as any housing where children cannot reside, such as group housing and senior housing. Hotels, motels and military housing were also ineligible because of anticipated difficulties gaining access, although children may sometimes reside in such housing. The survey design was a three-stage cluster sample of the target population. The first stage consisted of 100 primary sampling units, which were metropolitan statistical areas, single counties or groups of counties. The CIS were randomly selected with probability proportional to population according to the 2000 census. The second stage of sampling was to select segments from each zoo with probability proportional to the number of housing units. A segment typically consisted of several city blocks, although it could be much larger in rural areas. The number of segments in a zoo was usually 5, but ranged from 4, 12 depending on the size population of the zoo. The third and final stage of sampling was to select a number of housing units in each segment at random. Four housing units per segment were selected in earlier SUS and five in later SUS. Ultimately, a sample of two, 224 housing units was drawn, from which one, 131 eligible homes were recruited and completed the survey. The principal reasons 49 of sampled homes did not complete the survey were ineligibility 10, inability to contact the resident 10 and refusal 23. The insert design was similar to us, but the SIS, segments and housing units selected were different. Field operations took approximately one year. A two-person team consisting of a trained interviewer and a state-certified lead-based paint inspector risk assessor was dispatched to each suit. The interviewer arrived first and spent five days locating, visiting and attempting to recruit and schedule the 16, 25 selected housing units in the Sioux, each of which had been mailed an advance letter explaining the survey and announcing the interviewer's visit. The advance letters contained a 10 bill to get the attention of the recipient and induce them to read the letter. An additional cash incentive of 130 to be paid after completion of all sampling was offered to households to induce them to participate in the survey. After five days, the risk assessor arrived in the Sioux and began data collection with the interviewer and units already recruited. Between data collection visits, the interviewer continued to recruit additional units. The work in the Sioux continued until data had been collected in all recruited units and no further units could be recruited. Total time in a Sioux ranged from 2-3 weeks, depending on the number of units successfully recruited. In each home, the interviewer conducted an inventory of rooms and then selected four in which sampling was to be conducted, one room at random from each of four rooms strata, kitchens, common living areas, bedrooms children's only at present and all other rooms. If there was an ES6 accessible basement used for habitation, the largest room in it was also selected. 
The interviewer administered a questionnaire to a household representative, entering all data into a tablet PC in which the questionnaire was programmed. The interviewer then collected vacuum dust samples for allergen and mold analysis from the floor of the home. Concurrently with the interviewer's activities, the risk assessor conducted lead testing and paint using a portable X-ray fluorescence XRF instrument, collected dust wipe floor samples for pesticides 11, lead and arsenic, and took soil samples in the yard for lead and arsenic. Data collection in a home took several hours, depending on the type and size of the home. At the end of each day, lead testing data was downloaded from the XRF to the tablet PC and mailed, along with the questionnaire data, to Quantex's offices. When work in a zoo was completed, the tablet PC and all paper forms were returned to Quantech. The tablet PCs were then downloaded to provide a second copy of the data in addition to that sent by email. The XRF instruments were returned to the manufacturer for servicing between us. The manufacturer downloaded all data from the instruments to provide a third copy of the XRF data. These redundancies in data handling ensured that no significant loss of data occurred in this. Physical samples were stored in the zoo until all data collection was completed. Pesticide wipe samples were kept frozen in portable freezers provided to the field teams. Other samples were not frozen. At the end of activities in the zoo, all samples, with the exception of the pesticide wipes, were shipped to Quantex offices for inventory, day to entry and transmittal to analysis laboratories. The pesticide samples were shipped frozen overnight to a laboratory designated by Environmental Protection Agency. To simplify things, we're just going to share the results of the lead-based pain findings. In the Northeast, 55% of housing stock had above average levels of lead, 53% in the Midwest, 27% in the South and 32% in the West. Long story short, lawsuits have a better chance of happening when a broker fails to recommend experts to customers and clients when purchasing a home compared to those licensees who are more proactive. Sponsoring brokers should keep on top of leading environmental concerns that impact your particular geographic area and educate all associates accordingly. Lead-based paid disclosure laws minimally require that you advise buyers or tenants of any known lead-based paint hazards, provide purchasers or tenants with a federally approved lead-based paint hazard information pamphlet, and include specific language in all sales contracts or leases. In addition, purchasers receive 10 days in which to inspect for lead-based paint. The EPA can inspect your records to assure that you comply with the regulations. Another area of concern involves the Real Estate Settlement Procedures Act. These violations occur when mortgage brokers, lenders, title services, or real estate brokers give or receive anything of value in return for referrals. RISPA is designed to inform home buyers about the costs of closing and eliminate kickbacks to settlement service providers including real estate brokers for referrals. Although most referral fees are prohibited, the law expressly permits referral fees between two real estate brokers. Also, you must disclose if you have ownership in another service provider, such as a lender or insurance company to which you're referring a consumer. Make sure to understand the law's prohibitions and be sure to follow the rules carefully especially with referrals and service providers. Another area of concern is to limit legal liability on how you give advice. In particular, legal advice. Know the parameters of what you may and may not do in your state, and urge clients to hire a lawyer if they have legal questions. Get into the practice of regularly stating, my understanding is blah blah blah, but only an attorney can give you legal advice. We conclude with violations of the Americans with Disabilities Act, now a federal fair housing concern as well. These violations have been brought against real estate brokers who fail to do what's readily achievable with reasonable effort and expense to serve clients with disabilities. Items that fall in this genre include, making sure that a real estate office which is considered a public accommodation is equipped with curb brakes, ramps, proximate parking spaces and other considerations to allow a disabled person to easily access the building. 
Some of the other lawsuits involving the Americans with Disabilities Act deal with employment provisions, which mostly apply to real estate offices having 15 or more employees and broker owners need to be careful and not discriminate against qualified individuals who may have a disability. Be sure to click check answers to record your time and thank you for your attention to these important concepts.